Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the London School of Economics. Uh, my name's Charlie Beckett. I run uh, Polis, which is the journalism think tank based in the Media and Communications Department here at the LSE. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome tonight um, Justin Webb from the BBC and Kirsty Young, because not only have we got a really interesting subject tonight, which is, of course, you know, what the world thinks of the most powerful nation on the earth, but we've also got two, we're going to have a masterclass, if you like, in, in presentation, because Justin and Kirsty are both, in their different ways, uh, uh, great proponents of the art of uh, presentation on broadcast television and radio. Um, a quick advert on behalf of Polis. Later this week, on Thursday, we've got, um, got two more events this week. On Thursday, we've got uh, Christian Lander, uh, the American blogger, uh, coming to talk about his uh, blog and his website, Stuff That White People Like. And uh, then on Friday, we've got a not entirely unrelated subject. We've got uh, George Alagaya, who's... Um, a BBC journalist and presents BBC Six O'Clock News, who's going to be talking about uh, news and identity in our series of media dialogues. So lots happening with Polis. But tonight, we're very pleased to be partnering up with the Media Society uh, on tonight's event. I'm just going to hand you over quickly to John Mayer from the Media Society, who's going to have a quick word. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, when, 15 years ago, I made the 100th anniversary video for the LSE, presented by Lloyd Grossman, yes, he did come to the LSE, starring Mick Jagger. I went to Justin, I went to Charles Saatchi, or whichever Saatchi it is, and said, would he appear, and didn't get a reply. And I went to Justin and got an instant reply saying, love to, LSE old boy. And I asked him a few minutes ago, I said, what subject do you do here? He said, I can't remember. <laughs> so that tells you something about the effect of LSE on, on, uh, on students, but it, it's a huge privilege to get, invite Justin back here to his alma mater, and he was gagging to do it. And Kirsty, when she was approached, said, I love Justin Webb. Yes, I'd love to do it. And we, we juggled days until we, we got a day that everybody could do. So um, Justin will be signing the book afterwards, outside. Uh, you don't want to listen to me. Over to Kirsty. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Justin Webb, of course, is uh, best known to most of us as the BBC's North America editor. It is a job that I think, he's right, I'm a bit of a sort of sad fan. I think you did it quite brilliantly. I have to also admit that his timing was very good. Justin's time as uh, the BBC's North America editor was bookended by the two most significant <laughs> points in recent US history, namely 9-11 and the election of Barack Obama. But I think his skill, his insight, and his originality as a broadcast journalist set him apart from the pack. Um, he says of his time in the US, I went to America thinking it was like Britain, only bigger. I came away realising that culturally it is unique. Um, I want to begin, Justin, by asking you to tell me about the Kiwa ice cream social, <laughs> which fascinated me in your book and was sort of not quite an allegory, but a, but a brilliant example, you think, of sort of what America's about. And it's the good and the bad. And if anyone's been to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, um, beautiful, beautiful city, but also, of course, the deep south, one of the great centres of the slave trade, the place the Civil War began, a troubled place, still a troubled place. You go to the centre of Charleston, it's all very wealthy and all very white. You go to the suburbs and uh, it's n not only not wealthy, but also there are ghettos of people living there and plenty don't want to. There's a lot wrong with it. You go to Kiwa Island, which is kind of holiday camp, um, which we took the children to year upon year, which is about half an hour south. And you come across a kind of a side of America that is absolutely um, uh, redolent of the whole place. The Keor Island social, where there's a, an entertainer, and it's all terribly innocent, and it's good fun, and it's aimed at children. Um, there's a sign on the door saying, um, uh, at 8 o'clock, there'll be um, shagging on the pier. Um, but shagging is a, is a South Carolina country dance. And there's this sort of sense that there is, I mean, it's wonderfully American is that there is no irony. Irony is sort of booked in a long way before you ever get there. 
Um, but also there is a genuine sort of innocence, a kind of 1950s in English terms, homespun innocence that I think Americans do and we've sort of forgotten how to or perhaps lost interest in doing, which exists in this place. Anyway, so you go in, you go to the ice cream social and the children are wonderfully entertained and then uh, at the end of it, the entertainer who tells all sorts of jokes about um, life generally and one of his jokes is, you know, us Americans, we ever invented any wonderful instruments? And they go through all the instruments that other people have invented. The French horn, obviously invented in France, and various other things. And then he gets to, what have we invented here um, uh, in America? Nobody can come up with anything very much. Someone suggested tambourine. And there are various other sort of, sort of efforts. Um, uh, and in the end, he comes up with, and I can't remember what the instrument is, something like a triangle. or a, I mean, it's, it's, it's something a kazoo. That's, a kazoo, that's it. So it's sort of basic and democratic, and anyone can play it, which is sort of a very American approach to music. But they're all terribly proud of it. They say, yay, kazoo. And then finally, sorry to ramble on for my first hours, but finally he says, and where are you all from? And you have this incredible thing where it's the parents, not the children, who's saying, Ohio. And people going, yay, Ohio. And then someone else says, Arkansas. And people say, yay, Arkansas. And I was thinking, you know, the British Butlins has never echoed to the kind of, <laughs> where are you all from? Norfolk. Yay, Norfolk. <laughs> and it is that incredible attachment to place, which is both a weakness in America, because it does lead to a, a kind of blinkered attitude to the outside world, but also an amazing strength that gives people this adherence to the society that they believe that they created an adherence that is local and also, I think, allows them then to be more patriotic than we are when it comes to the, the nation itself. Now, of course, you are an, an enthusiast for America and the problem with, and I don't want to stretch the Kiwa analogy too far, but of course, you got into Kiwa, you got beyond the gates yeah. because you had the cash to pay. But yeah. if, if we want to stretch the analogy yeah. across America as a whole and extrapolate it, well, there are plenty of people who don't feel part of the dream because they haven't got yeah. the money to get through the gates. But when you go to them and you say, how do you feel about living in this country where everything's blocked out to you? I mean, the shocking thing is how much they love it. Uh, and I mean, you can say that they're all brainwashed and all the rest of it. And, and there is an element of brainwashing in all societies as, as uh, you know, students of the LSE know more than, more than anyone else. But um, I don't mean because you're at the LSE. Well, possibly. Um, but, but, uh, you know, and I, I don't discount that, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, an intelligent approach to America would not discount that. But the fact is that in Seattle, they had a vote, um, this was a few years ago now, to have a more expensive car tax for bigger cars, uh, and it was defeated. And when they did the, the minute um, work on the sort of zephology, who voted for, for what, they discovered that overwhelmingly wealthier people in Seattle, as you might expect, wealthy West Coast people, they voted in favor of paying more for their cars. It was the poor who said no. And the reason is they all think, well, tomorrow, actually, I'll have a big car. When things work out, uh, when the job works out, when we move across the country and I start again. And there is this, and again, you can overstate it, but it is um, a part of American life, this sense that everything is potentially available to everyone. Uh, it ain't true in all cases, but it's more true uh, than it has been in a lot of other societies. It's also, interestingly, becoming less true, and I think this is a problem for America now, um, and serious students of America have to accept that, that social mobility is not actually what it once was, but there is this belief still, and it's a great belief to have, um, that people right across income groups have, that you can make it, and if you want to go to Kiowa and hear the joke about the kazoo, you'll get there one day. Um, your son, Sam, you quote him in the book as saying, when you first reach America, yeah. he says to you, America's rich, right? But it doesn't look it. And that, I mean, what, what a brilliantly observant uh, young man he is, because of course, if you spend any amount of time in America at all, you know that a lot of the time the telecommunications don't work, you know, your cell will go down often, the roads are full of potholes, the ambulance will not take you away. You know, there are all sorts of thing, <clears throat> things about America yeah. that border on the third world that is just yeah. clinging on to the first world, it seems, yeah. in some respects, with its fingertips. Yeah, and, and I mean, infant mortality is, is the obvious one, which, uh, you know, overall in America is not disastrously bad, but it's still pretty poor when you think of how rich the place is. And in some pockets of the United States is, is, is obviously just um, uh, unbelievably poor. One of the great driving forces, I think, for Obama's election was a belief among that went right across Americans, and particularly those Americans who travel, 
which is their, their infrastructure is just staggeringly bad. And there was a real desire, quite apart from the economic crisis and the need to, you know, to spend money on public works, etc. there was a real desire to update. And Americans were embarrassed when they traveled to, I don't know, Munich or Singapore um, and saw how other people had rebuilt and revivified their public spaces and are worried by how Americans um, fail to do that. So there is this juxtaposition that my son identified. We'd actually just been on a road trip through West Virginia, uh, which is anyone who know that, who has ever been there will know, is, is you know, there are people living in trailers by the side of the road, um, pretty much eating roadkill. I mean, it doesn't quite come to that, but you know, it's, it's a really rough existence in pockets of West Virginia. Um, and the question, it seems to me, is whether the one leads to the other. Does that poverty, does the fear of failure, does the awfulness of life if you're poor in America, and it is pretty awful compared with here, does that actually, is that what pushes the nation into being so staggeringly wealthy and successful and, um, and full of ideas and buzziness? Or is it, as some people argue, and I had this discussion the other day with a, a, a British former cabinet minister, is that's complete nonsense, and I suspect a lot of people here would think it's complete nonsense, that actually if you go to somewhere like Sweden where things are are much more compressed. You, you give people the freedom at all levels of society to take risks and to, and to, um, uh, and to experiment. And somewhere like, you know, I mean, I mean, I think, frankly, the jury is out, but I think Americans themselves believe very strongly that part of the strength of their society is the poverty. And they wouldn't put it like that, but is that kind of sense of, of, of you can climb very high, you can fall very low, and if you stop people falling very low, you will you'll stop people climbing high as well. You make a case in the book for, for what you call geo-freedom, and you describe how it is that the, the very land that the Americans have to deal with in all its diversity yeah. and all its savagery, with the weather conditions and with the mountains higher than mountains that we'll ever see in Europe and the rivers deeper, have somehow formed the American psyche. That this it's because they're constantly battling with the things that in Europe and certainly in Britain we don't have to battle with, that somehow mentally they come from a very, yeah. a very separate place. It had never struck me before I went to America or before I lived in America just how staggeringly dangerous the weather is in America. Um, I mean, leave aside earthquakes as a geological issue, just the weather. Uh, you know, you can flick open, as I did, I think I put it in the book, you flick open the Los Angeles Times, and on page four, it says 20 people were killed on highway whatever in Nevada today when a dust storm came and enveloped the road. And you're thinking, geez, you know, you don't get that in Somerset. Um, there is this real sense of ruggedness and toughness about daily American life. And I think I use it to make the point that Americans can, you know, American life with its executions and its brutality, um, uh, American society can often seem to Europeans to be just beyond the pale. And I, you know, in, in trying to account for that, or at least explain it and, and, and examine it, one of the things I suggest is that actually look at the weather, look at the, it's, it, it's a, a first world country with, with, with sort of s s third world in the old terms weather, weather that is really dangerous and hurts people every day. There are bears in American woods. Uh, and there aren't any bears. Well, are there bears in Britain? I don't no. think there are. I haven't no. been back long enough to find out. But it hasn't, hasn't yeah. changed in no, the last eight years. No, no. Um, and so do you think, I mean, it's interesting that you, I know you weren't quite saying there that it excuses what mm. most evolved Europeans like to think of as our much more um, intellectual approach to things like gun ownership and capital punishment. I, you draw the link, do you think that it is pointless to try to persuade Americans, either on an individual basis, I mean, I'm sure you had these conversations plenty of time over the eight years that you were there, mm. or on a a much bigger macro-political basis to try to pin them down on that and say, we understand the links, but it's time to change. I don't say it's pointless to try. If you want to try, and, you know, look, I work for the BBC. I don't have a, a dog in this fight, as it were. Um, but I do believe that it's worth bearing in mind that they are from such a different place that it's going to be a real, a real challenge to persuade them. If you want Americans to become like Luxembourgers, uh, you're going to have a real job of work, and it's going to take probably more than a few I don't years. Want them to. No, no. I mean, frankly, I don't either, and I don't think you know. I mean, people within America, as you all know very well, one of the attacks on the Obama administration has been that it's European socialism, 
Um, uh, and, and he often gets it in the neck for being European. There was a, a joke told at his expense on the campaign trail when we used to follow him around. That his, his, I think it was in Pennsylvania where he had a lot of trouble bowling. And as any Americans here will know, you have to be able to bowl to become president, or at least pretend you can bowl. <laughs> and, and, and he couldn't. I mean, he's absolutely hopeless at it. Um, all he wanted to do was, was sit in the truck eating um, arugula with his, um, with his <laughs> friends. So at one stage, his, his minders take him to one side and say, look, Barack, you're not, you're not making it with people. You're not getting through to the common person. You're not speaking their language. And Obama draws himself to his full height and says, au contraire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Which may or may not be true, but it's quite funny. Yeah. You, you talk about bowling. Didn't he catch the orange that you bowled down the, the lane of the uh, Yeah, the there's a sort of Tell ludicrous joke that there's always... I mean, I think it's probably been played since, since, well, since Nixon went to China, which is the first kind of properly organised press trip where everyone's really excited to be on board and you feel sort of close to power, however much you're obviously not, because <laughs> you're way below the engines at the back. And so you go on his press plane, and it's fascinating travelling with a, someone who's trying to become president um, because you see the process whereby they gradually move away from being a human being and become something else. And, it's fair, and, and, and physically, you, can, you can't get to them anymore. Um, uh, y y so all you can do, and what they do do on press planes as they take off, is try bowling any round object, and as often an orange, up the plane to where the VIP is at the top. And apparently, I didn't go on Hillary Clinton's plane, I don't think at all, but apparently on Hillary Clinton's plane, you know, the orange would get to the top and just roll back to the bottom. And people sort of look away. And on Obama's, his hand came down and catches it. And there's this sort of feeling then, of, of, and I write in the book, this is the closest thing to fellow feeling that there is between the, the candidate and the press. And they all think, hey, we're in there. Uh, how ludicrous that is. Um, but yeah, so his ability to catch an orange uh, is, is undisputed, but his ability to bowl <laughs> was the problem in the election. Um, I, did, I did plan to leave Obama till later, but almost mm. inevitably it, it comes up sooner than, than you expect. Can you describe, uh, was that there probably wasn't a particular singular moment, but was, were there a particular few days when suddenly the guy whose name nobody could pronounce was the guy who everybody got a funny feeling about, that suddenly Hillary was going to get more than a run for her money? Yeah, there were two moments. Number one was the moment where he made his first um, uh, um, foray into genuine voted for, although it wasn't quite a vote, but, but, but genuine kind of polled success. Um, and that was in Iowa. So the very first contest where suddenly he swept through and won. And it wasn't just that he beat her in Iowa this considerable shock as it was, but also that it became obvious that he had a plan all the time to beat her in Iowa. So when people like me, sort of six months before, say, what's happened to Barack Obama? I remember someone just discussing, there was a, a, a democratic um, uh, debate with all the candidates, and, and, and Hillary Clinton, one of them, and all the other candidates, including Barack Obama, and someone described it as Gladys Knight and the Pips, uh, you know, which gives you an idea of where everyone thought everyone else was, including Obama. Um, until you get to that January, I think it was sort of uh, maybe January the third, and, and and suddenly he's there, and not only is he there, but he's been planning it all along. So the Iowa caucuses are really weird of, of events, in a in a way incredibly undemocratic, because if you can't be there, you can't vote. Um, if you can't get to someone's sitting room um, because you have mobility problems or because you're away visiting your auntie in Nebraska, you, you're actually sort of disenfranchised. It's a very weird system, but at the same time, highly democratic, because if you do turn up, you really get to you must choose the next president, which, which many people in Iowa are rather pleased about. So, so there, he, he mugged her, and that was one of the, the absolute key moments in him, in him managing it. But the other thing that, that you really got a sense of, of his power was in the debates where he was, the debates, we're still talking about the Democratic Party debates, the last ones that he held with her, where he was measured and calm and she looked increasingly desperate. And you realise then that this incredible cool that he has um, was going to see him through or had the potential to see him through. Do you think it comes down to character in the end? Do you think no matter how many debates there are, no matter how many uh, correspondents like you that are filing thousands of words, that in the end the American people look at the character of the person and that's how they decide? Uh, the character is part of it, but I think the interesting thing about 2008, one of the interesting things about 2008 is you're also looking at uh, 
I mean, people were genuinely looking for something different. And I think <laughs> however Mrs. Clinton's character might have, have, have borne up, and I think people, you know, Democrats had a lot of respect for her, there was this feeling that we really want something different. Um, and to go back to the kind of Clinton-Bush um, uh, duopoly would be wrong. So in a sense, that then separates it out from character. Um, what it isn't, of course, is, is policy in the sense that, you know, there's no manifesto, yeah. which is fascinating, actually, having been sort of steeped in British politics. I, mean, I don't remember much of it now, but I think that's what I did do at the LSE. And that, you know, you got this, this sort of sense of, of, of particularly in old-fashioned British politics, where there was a manifesto and there were pledges. Uh, and American election, as many of you know, is pretty light on, <coughs> on pledges. But, but so, so the, the character was, was part of it. But the character has got to embody something that Americans can believe about themselves. And I think Americans fancied believing about themselves. Number one, we're kind of over a lot of the, the nightmares of our past. Um, and number two, that we want someone who is going to present a different face to the world after what you know, many Americans, and by the end, frankly, probably 70% of Americans, thought was the embarrassments of the last eight years. Yeah, I mean, it was the rebranding. It was brand America rebranding. reborn Yeah, yeah. In, in that sense. Yeah. Um, you were never somebody who went in for easy W bashing. You were always, it struck me as, as simply a viewer, it struck me, you were somebody who was scrupulously fair. Well, I felt it was our job uh, in the BBC not to take easy shots at someone who, uh, about whom it was quite easy to take shots, if you yeah. see what I mean. And you felt there were lots of people sitting at home who'd be taking the shots and you didn't need to kind of add to the process. And in fact, what you probably need to do is to just suggest ways, or at least suggest why it was that the guy was re-elected. Um, <laughs> because that, you know, to, to, to so many people outside America, that was the biggest shot, wasn't it, in, in, in 04? And to give a sense of his political skills, and he certainly did have them, and his people had them. And although it all went pretty much completely haywire towards the end, and I mean, nobody really knows what he was doing. My colleague, Matt Fry, went to interview him uh, uh, in less than a year before the end, and, and you know, Matt, you know, doing an interview with even a president at the end of his term is quite a big deal. And Matt had done the interview and wanted to go and file it and couldn't get away. And Bush was saying, oh, come on, let's go and walk over here. And Matt, Matt eventually had to say, look, I'm very sorry, Mr. President, I've got to go now. You've got to kind of, sort of insight into the life that he must have led in the White House in the last year or so. Uh, what about, I don't know if you've had time to see it today, but Anita Dunn, a, a strategist with the Obama campaign, is, I mean, I don't think crowing would be too strong a word today, as she's quoted in the press, to, the press at least, as saying that we controlled the press. We did it beautifully. There was not a single message that got out there with, and she talks a lot about this, the idea of directly speaking to the people on YouTube, and, you know, that the press pack, the press corps, as they followed Obama around, only ever got exactly what they intended them to get. Did you, did you feel, did you have any sense of that? Did you feel the pressure of that? Uh, for a, a campaign suggesting, if only subliminally, that they were of the world and just as open and hmm. nice as it's possible to be, they were staggeringly on message. It reminded me of New Labour, actually, as they came to power here. There was a real discipline during the course of the campaign about the message and who they were addressing it to. Um, and I remember going to... Um, you know, at a very early stage to um, try to get an interview with Obama on the, on the campaign trail and just, you know, they were reasonably polite, but that was where it ended. There was never the slightest possibility that we were going to get close to him. Uh, and nobody did who were, who were foreigners. And in terms of their choice of, of, of people in, in the States, yeah, again, they, they'd really thought it through what they were going to do, not necessarily illegitimately, <laughs> Um, in, in the sense that, you know, why shouldn't you if you're putting someone forward and you want to put their best, best foot forward? Uh, well, it's interesting you draw the parallel with New Labour there because far be it from me to be an, an apologist for uh, New Labour, but certainly if you were to ask the press secretaries who were operating during New Labour's strongest time, they would say that they ended up trying to control everything because the media cynically manipulated everything and it was the hungry beast of 24-hour news that would distort something that wasn't really a story and turn it into rolling news mm. with its massive headlines I mean, and its breaking news banners and funny they enough, were replying to that. If yeah, you know. I mean, I think we've gone beyond that and I think the Americans went beyond that in 08 and we're going to go beyond it in our election. It's going to be a very interesting uh, lesson for Brits as we, as we reach the genuine internet age. We thought we'd reached it last time and the time before, but the issue now 
is that everyone has got a flip video in their back pocket. And it's incredibly difficult to control and keep um, discipline and order and just the slightest little embarrassing thing from, from getting out. Um, it all goes onto YouTube. And there was a famous occasion in the 06 midterm elections when a guy called George Allen, a um, uh, senator from Virginia, um, uh, was being harassed by someone from his opponent's campaign and uh, turned to him and said, um, let's all give a big round of applause to our friend here, Makaka. And nobody had the foggiest idea what Makaka was meant to mean. It turns out to be some peculiar sort of French Algerian form of abuse. It's a racial, it's a racial, racist form of abuse, basically. And why on earth George Allen, who's I doubt ever been outside Virginia, would, would suddenly bring it up? Who, who only knows? Anyway, the interesting thing is, he was sailing home not only to win Virginia, which had been his, his, his Senate seat for a long time, but also actually he was a real potential Republican candidate in 08 and a potential winner. He destroyed his entire career with that one word, Makaka. It went onto YouTube, there was a storm around it, he was finished. He lost his Senate seat in 06 and he's finished as a, as a politician. And that actually is the big fear that, that American politicians had two years later uh, in 08. And I think it's an interesting one, I and mean, it's not really our subject, but, but how that's going to play out here for the first. It's not the first internet election, it's the first flip video and YouTube election. Um, you touched on the, the very seductive feeling of being part of, you know, the proximity to potential power starts to, to make possibly journalists themselves feel like they're rather high and mighty. How do you resist that feeling in the bubble when, you, when you're travelling with the press pack, who's watching every nuance and who thinks that they, are, they were the winning guy? A little bit of you doesn't resist it, actually, I have to say. <laughs> when you take off in Air Force One, and you look on the ground, and there are people looking up and waving. You know? I mean, it's terribly tempting to wave back, isn't it? <laughs> Even though you're in that kind of crappy compartment at the back, and there are only windows on one side and all the rest. Weren't you escorted onto Air Force One by yeah, the Secret by, Service? Yeah, by, by the Secret Service. I missed it. I, I woke up in a hotel in, in Oxford Street, having missed my, my one and only opportunity to get on it for a very glamorous trip between Heathrow and Teesside. This was when <laughs> President Bush was still in power, and we were going up to see Blair. And I got, I went down to the press center in the hotel and I said to the White House staff, sorry, I think I've missed it. And they just said, oh, well, actually, they didn't speak to me. They just picked up a phone and, said, and sort of muttered into it and put me in a car. And the car drove straight onto the steps of the plane, basically, right for kind of almost over the verges in Heathrow. It's a fantastic way, not only of going to Heathrow, but also going to Teesside, if any of you have to. <laughs> uh, it's much quicker than, than, than the various alternatives. But yeah, so there is this sense of being caught up in the bubble. And I think it's fair to say that White House reporting, White House correspondents tend to be um, a very um, uh, self-regarding group of people. And in some <coughs> cases, quite rightly, because they're very able people, and, and they do a reasonably good job of, of, of holding to account the White House. But I think they suffer, in a sense, from the same problem that we suffer from in the past here with the lobby, that you go into that building every day and you kind of are sucked into the orbit of, of whomsoever happens to be president and his or her people. Um, you say in your book that we bend over backwards here in, in Britain to understand the Arab street and yet we seem loath to try and understand, understand the, the American street. Why do you think we have that inbuilt resistance? Why is there not the appetite? Because I think we regard America as being, um, we regard America's um, successes as being somehow achieved through luck rather than skill or theft from the Native Americans rather than any kind of effort on, on the part of Americans themselves. And we have this kind of cultural contempt for the United States, which Obama himself, interestingly, is, is aware of and, and makes angry, or it makes him angry. This sense that things that are American tend to be sort of low-grade and hopeless. And it's something that comes not only from the left, as you tend to hear it now, but also, of course, classically in European thought from the right, yeah. where people were worried about democracy and worried about the building of a society on something, on ties other than blood and, and kinship. Uh, and I think that, that sense, a sort of dislike and distrust, almost visceral sense, is still sometimes 
to the fore when we regard America. Whereas when we look at other areas of the world, and I, I mean, I mentioned the Arab street in the book, but I mean, you, you couldn't, you know, I, I always think of Mark Tully, as a wonderful BBC correspondent who spent so long in India and was generally regarded in Britain, at least, as, as, as you know, a thoroughly good guy and he got under the skin of India and he obviously loved India. Um, and nobody ever thought that that was a bad thing. But at various stages of my career in the States, people would sort of write to the BBC or to me and say, you know, it sounds as if you really like the place, and that's an outrage. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and it, I mean, it, it, it raises an interesting question, which is the extent to which a correspondent should be seen as being separate from a place, and that's a legitimate uh, issue. Um, but but so your sort of fundamental understanding and sense of, of liking for a people um, and for the individuals you meet, I don't think uh, is, a, is necessarily a bad thing in a foreign correspondent. And it just interested me that people would, would necessarily or, or would always think about it. And when we said we were coming back, they'd say, well, have, what about, well, how will you get rid of your children's accents? And I say, well, why should we? I mean, I love it that they talk with American accents. Uh, do you think that the difference really is because it is historically a society that's been built from the bottom up? rather than what we are used to here in Britain, which is a society that, through its sort of feudal history and, and so on, has had the way it is handed to them from the top down. I think it's... I mean, you really need to... You need to be doing a psychology degree rather than anything else to, to, to get to. The, the, the German academic, uh, Joseph Joffe, who, who writes penetratingly about the US, has suggested... And I'm not sure I can remember his phrase, but it's something like the... It's, it's the contempt you feel for the soft-poured seducer. In other words, you sort of, we, the outside world, we wake up the, the night after, we've kind of fallen in love with yet another American thing, whether it's Google or, or you know, whatever it is, um, uh, or valet parking, uh, you know, and, and, and Which we Which I have feel... to tell people Justin complained about tonight <laughs> as he arrived. Oh, I'm sorry going. I'm late, there was no valet parking. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> And we have this kind of sense of um, uh, being disgusted with ourselves for falling in love with those American things. And then that, that makes us over-anxious to dismiss and dislike um, Americans in, in, in that way. I mean, maybe that, that, that's his theory, and I, I, you know, I, I think it has some truth in it. How much do they care about us? Hmm. I mean, we are preoccupied with them, even when we pretend not to be, and as you say, we're in love with so many yeah. things. Yeah. American. How much? Uh, I mean, I, here's the good news for a Brit with a pucker accent like mine. You can go to, to, to Kansas City, Missouri and order a cup of coffee. You know, could I have a cappuccino, please? And they say, oh my God, could you just say that again? And he's like, you know, I mean, that, that is the special relationship you with know, a Brit bar. You get this kind of. So, in a sense, you're sort of already there as a, as, as a certain sort of, of Brit. I think there is an enormous, I mean, I think one of the great kind of myths about America is that um, it is entirely inward looking. Um, and if you think, you know, we are in a, one of the great universities of the world, if you think where the other great universities of the world are, actually, I don't know, 15 out of the top 20 are probably in the United States. Um, there is a whole community of Americans. Um, some of whom come and teach here at the LSE, who are incredibly involved in the outside world and helpful in the sense of bringing progress and, and success and happiness to large numbers of, of, of the population of the world. And that has been, you know, America has been the outside power, the outside looking power. And it set up the organs of international government that, that lasted, well, at least for quite a long time after the Second World War. On the other hand, you stay in Kansas City, Missouri, and, and you know, they probably haven't got a passport. Um, but what I say to that is that if you look at, I mean, again, it's one of these sort of easy things to say, oh, they don't have passports, they don't go anywhere. Actually, until recently, you didn't need a passport as an American to go to Canada or the Caribbean, or I think even to Mexico. Um, uh, so how many Brits have got passports only to go to Spain or France? I mean, it's actually, you know, we, we think of ourselves as being this kind of, or other, other nations as being incredibly intrepid explorers of the world, and Americans being incredibly insular. I'm not sure, actually, whether, whether that's really borne out in truth. I mean, I understand what you're saying about the upper echelons of American society reaching out to the rest of the world, but you, you will know. I mean, I know that has happened to me many times when I've been in America. And, you know, in fact, three times it's happened to me where people say, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Scotland. They say, 
is that in Ireland? You know, they really, they really, you know, it seems to me that yeah. it's sort of a charming notion, but they can't quite be bothered to look into it beyond that. I went on holiday around the States before leaving. I went on a sort of as, as grand a tour as we could manage before we left. And I ended up at the end of it thinking not, uh, um, why don't Americans get passports? But why would an American ever get a passport? I mean, there, there's an extraordinary array of um, cultural diversity, actually, quite apart from geographic diversity, within uh, even the continental United States. Never mind all the other little bits they can go to without, without necessarily having a passport. So I think, I think you can overstate it. On the other hand, yeah, it is, it is a fact that one of the things that um, uh, the modern American education system and media setup encourages, frankly, is ignorance of things that you don't want to be interested in. And it's a problem I think you know, we all face, and it's going to happen here as well. But the idea that Americans can completely avoid those things that don't necessarily seem to be attractive to them in the first blush is, is, um, is, is, has been the case probably for a decade or so, and it's slightly less the case um, here. But it's becoming the case. People can choose what they want to know about, uh, and that is a problem. But then you go to somewhere like San Antonio, Texas, and where 60% of people describe themselves as Latinos. And there's this sort of amazing, I mean, there are a lot of Americans, huge numbers of Americans are not from America. Um, you look at the American Olympic team as they were parading around before the Olympic Games. It's an incredible array of people. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are an awful lot of kind of fat white guys in the middle of the country who just go to the local church and don't really care about and certainly don't know where Scotland is. But equally, there are a hell of a lot of Scots. <coughs> what, who don't, who don't know where no, who are there? Who are there? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah all yeah. the best ones leave. Yeah. Um, what do you think? <laughs> that was a joke, obviously, that was a joke. Um, what do you think about the American connection with the flag? That's an intriguing thing for me when I'm there. You know, the, the flag is, of course, it's on all public yeah. buildings, but yeah. I'm talking more about the, yeah. the front porch approach to the yeah. flag in America. They are everywhere. They are. I mean, to be able to have uh, your country's flag on your underpants without ironic intent is, is, <laughs> is I mean, it's always struck me as, as a pretty amazing achievement. Um, I got used to it, and I, I grew rather to like it, um, uh, because it's quite a pretty design. And I, I sense, I mean, when you talk to Americans about their allegiance, it is an allegiance to themselves, which I think in a way is... Um, a really rather healthy thing. They don't sort of spruce up their towns. Uh, well, they do spruce up their towns when a president comes to town, but they don't, they're not, their allegiance is to the system, not to um, any individual. And they have an enormous respect for the flag, but they also have enormous respect for the kind of organs of, of, of the Constitution um, and the presidency. And um, th these things are all kind of bound up um, together. How they got to that place, and it really goes back to Kiowa, is I think initially feeling is an enormously strong sense of local community, um, which, which you know, we haven't managed to foster in this country, certainly not to that stage. Um, and they've also managed to stop their flag being stolen by those who want to use it in their own particular regard. And of course, there are plenty of attempts, and, and in a sense, the, the right during the Bush years, tried to steal the flag and wrap themselves in it. But it's terribly difficult to do in American politics. It's interesting that that symbol really genuinely does belong to everyone. And for a Democrat to be kind of waving a flag is not, in, a, in American, in the American political lexicon, is not an odd sight. You wouldn't think, oh, let's see the Democrats are doing a bit of flag waving. It is part of everyone. And I think that's an amazing achievement. Uh, what about naturalization? I mean, one of the things, in, indeed, in Britain, we've begun to ape this idea that the Americans uh, were on to a long time ago, which is if people want to come and live in the country, we welcome them and we want them to buy into our ideals. And it, it, and it may be, of course, that there have famously been race riots and vicious ones on the streets of America over the years. But in terms of um, immigrant populations, um, well, integrating themselves, and I know that can be an incendiary word these days, but actually buying into the ideal that is America, do you think there's something we can learn from that in Europe? I think it's interesting that America has managed to avoid, I mean, there is a nativist um, uh, kind of theme going through American political history, as many of you will know better than I do, and it's, it's been there or thereabouts almost forever. 
And you think back to the 19th century where the, the targets were the Chinese immigrants, and then into this century where there have been all number of char targets, the, the Italians, um, even until quite recently. I mean, it's still a quite, a, to many Americans, still rather remarkable that Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, not because she's a woman, because she's Italian-American. Um, rather amazing that um, Samuel Alito is a Supreme Court judge, um, not because he's an amazing lawyer, and because he's an Italian-American. I mean, you, you, you realize that these things, these wounds, can last a long time, and they're genuine. And to suggest that America is simply welcoming you, everybody wants to come at all stages, is, is plainly ludicrous. On the other hand, there is a kind of national myth that Americans feel that they need to buy into and God knows have done staggeringly successfully. I mean, this is a, an empirical fact over time. There has been no movement of humanity on that scale in the whole history of humanity of people going to one place and making it home. And it still happens. Um, and, you know, by and large, there is a huge issue at the moment about Mexicans. And you hear all the same things said about Mexicans that you probably once they are once on upon a time, heard about Italians. Are oh, they only coming for the money? They don't really love America. They're all going to send the money back, then they're going to go back themselves, etc., etc., etc. And there is that tendency. But it interested me during the 08 election on the Republican side, where the nativists are, that um, Thomas Tancredo, the out and out nativist candidate who wanted to stop uh, immigration, uh, not only illegal immigration, but stop most legal immigration as well. Um, uh, and who wanted to stop the right of people like my youngest daughter, who is an American citizen, simply by dint of the fact that she was born there, who wanted to stop all that. He, in the end, got absolutely blown away in the Republican primaries. Um, and I remember him saying to me, I said, who's going to win the presidency? And he said, it'll be someone with better hair than me, which is a kind of slight sort of... I mean, the fact is it was his policies that did him down, and that, that nativist tendency in America, because it clashes so much with America's national myth, um, has genuinely, has, has never really sort of held political ground. So there is this ability to pull people together, uh, and you can pick holes in it, and in, in many aspects it doesn't work as well as Americans believe that it should or does, um, but it's still there. It's part of the makeup of America, is this idea that it is a place that belongs to all of us. In his inauguration, Obama said that America is ready to lead once more. I mean, the Americans might be confident of the fact that they are ready for that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they misunderstand how much of an appetite or not there is for, uh, among citizens of the rest of the world? I think this comes... I mean, the whole idea of American exceptionalism, Obama has trouble with. Mm. And Americans genuinely also have trouble with, I think, because... They are, generally speaking, um, an unimperial group of people if you meet them one to one. Uh, they have no particular desire to subjugate anyone, most Americans. On the other hand, as we all know, you know one of the themes of American history, um, in spite of an express desire not to do it early on, has been a kind of sense in which they have gone out, certainly economically and in many cases militarily, to, to build the world in the way that they think the world ought to be built. And I think there is that sort of, and, and Obama, in a sense, in, in, inhabits in his own mind the, 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 the difficult duality of, of, number one, believing in American leadership, but number one, not believing in American <coughs> leadership because he doesn't really believe in American exceptionalism. Um, and a, a, a colleague of mine on the FT asked him this, this very question, do you believe in American exceptionalism? And he utterly dodged it. He said, I believe in American exceptionalism the same way as a Greek person believes in Greek exceptionalism or a Brit in British exceptionalism. And you're thinking, well, that, isn't, that kind of isn't the point, because there is something really fundamentally different about the way in which Americans regard, not their nation in the sense that they want to take over the world, but regard their, their way of government and their kind of national myth and their, and their freedom as being something that, given all other things being equal, everyone in the world would want to choose. And I don't think... You know, a Greek person necessarily has that view of, of life in Greece or a Brit of life in Britain. I'm going to open uh, to questions uh, from the floor in a second. I want to ask you how you're finding the 3 a.m. starts. Do you have to get up at 3 a.m. for the Today programme? 3.05, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's fine. I mean, I, I, you know, anyone here who's you know, mostly probably too young to have gone down this road, once you've had children, I mean, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning really doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Um, uh, so it's... it's um, you know, I used to present breakfast television many years ago, 
Uh, and the average audience for breakfast television is you know, considerably less than the numbers in this room, or were when I did it, because I was so useless at it. And the Today programme kind of seems to matter. So you feel, actually, after you've had an espresso, you know, it's worth getting up at 3 o'clock. But I've only been doing it for two months, so it's early days. OK. Um, we have got people with roving microphones, I think. If you have a question, and I would like to stress a question, then uh, please do ask it to Justin. Um, the gentleman there in the cream sweater. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, Justin, could you give us some insight into how you feel race relations are in the United States, particularly now you've got an African-American president, but with, it would appear, the continuation of a large amount of segregation, not to mention economic inequality. How significant, for example, is affirmative action still? Thank you. I think, I mean, that, that is a fascinating issue, and, it, and it <clears throat> I suggest in the book that it's one of those areas um, in the United States where, I mean, I, I have a chapter called What's Wrong with America? And, and I suggest that the extent to which Americans believe they are over race um, is way, way exaggerated in, in most sort of polite suburban American minds. And I think, frankly, the experience, I mean, lots of other things I wrote in the book have been, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd very cheerfully now cross out in the light of things that have happened while, since Obama came to power. But I do think that one, that, that Obama's, coming to power has not really um, uh, resolved the race issue, put it to bed in the, in the way that I think a lot of Americans intended that it would. Um, and that's for one obvious reason, <clears throat> and that is that slavery <clears throat> was such a grotesque thing and was such a part of the original setup that it's like, as someone has written, it's, it's an original sin. It's not something you can just uh, say, well, that's over now, we dealt with it, it's past. It, it, and you realize this, I never realized this until I lived there, it's different from race relations in other countries, and you know, we have racial tension in, in Britain, but that the, the stain of slavery and the sense in which it goes down the generations um, and will go down the generations for hundreds of years to come, um, the electing of a black president um, uh, doesn't really uh, deal with that in any kind of fundamental sense. Uh, I also think that Obama... You know, as an individual, he took a decision not to be a black president um, quite early on in his, in his, in his campaign. Um, uh, he, he wasn't from the kind of Jesse Jackson stable of, of, of people who were steeped in the civil rights movement. And that was a conscious thing, and he didn't want to be angry or threatening. Uh, and, and one of the great achievements of his entire campaign is that he was never angry. Or threatening. Even when Jeremiah Wright, that whole fuss over that, that preacher came up, he managed to, to step away from it and, and never to threaten white people. The flip side of that is that you don't then fully address. I was at a press conference at the White House recently and, a, and a, 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 um, an African-American reporter asked him about the unemployment rate for African-Americans in Chicago, I think it was, and, and he just... He wouldn't go there. He just said, "Well, you know, unemployment is a terrible thing. Doesn't matter what racial background you come from, it's a terrible thing, and we're going to solve it for all Americans." And and you know, so in a sense, you could argue that a kind of Clinton-style person would have been able to address those things. And affirmative action is another one, which is really under threat in large swathes of America, both from the Supreme Court, but also from a sort of general sense among Americans that it's that it's past its usefulness whereas it may not be past its usefulness in some, in some aspects. So I think the idea that Obama sort of brings with him um, uh, big changes, I, I don't think that was ever part of the agenda, either explicitly or, or implicitly. Indeed, there was a huge flurry around Michelle Obama during the campaign when she was beginning to be perceived as somebody who yeah. was, yeah. well, I mean, militant, yeah. if you can reasonably use that word, somebody with you know, a black woman with a point of view. So she said, for the first time in my adult life, I'm proud of my country. Yes. And it was absolutely seized on. And, and it was interesting because it just showed how careful um, Barack Obama had been and how careful, in a sense, he needed to be in order to, to get elected. But the idea that his election has kind of really brought America to facing up and dealing with these things, I, I think is, um, I, I don't think it's the case. OK, let's take another uh, question. The gentleman there with the light shirt on. 
Hi, Dave Bowden from the uh, Battle of Ideas Festival, which is holding a series of debates about America and um, economy and culture at the end of the month. Um, I think one of the most interesting things, you know, for uh, people sort of this, uh, on this side of the ocean is uh, the kind of huge respect America has for the principles of free speech, and uh, particularly on the airways, where you have these characters such as Rush Limbaugh and Michael Savage, who of course isn't even allowed into this country, um, and Glenn Beck at the moment. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, given that we ha we're having an awful lot of controversy at the moment about having somebody like Nick Griffin on, you know, Question Time, and, and you know, Jan Moore in the uh, Daily Mail. I mean, how does that sort of play out, kind of on the ground in America? How are these kind of figures perceived? Is there an embarrassment about, you know, them, on, you know, on the Democratic left, or is they, are they very proud of the fact that even though they say these unpleasant things, they're still allowed to say them? Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> All those. I mean, one of the great kind of myths on the American right, and particularly in talk radio, which is where they have their kind of hardiest base. Uh, is that they're going to be banned. We're going to be banned. <laughs> the Democrats will get in and they've got all sorts of ways in which they're going to stifle us. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a useful myth, but it's complete nonsense because there is no real concerted effort, nor will there ever be, to ban um, those people. There have been various efforts on the left to fight back. And what is interesting, and I think, you know, I'm... I'm you put yourself in the, in the position of a left-wing American, you can feel pretty lonely. It doesn't always feel like freedom of speech. You can feel very crowded out, because if you literally go down the dime and you're, and you're driving through South Carolina, you know, you're not getting a full range of opinion, let's face it. But on the other hand, you know, what America says is that is freedom, and you have this Supreme Court decision, goodness knows how long ago, that, that the ability to spend money um, uh, is... is, is and, and spend money on political campaigning is tied up with freedom. And that means that it is possible for these people, if they can raise the money uh, and they keep within the rough framework of the law, it's possible for these people to, to carry on talking. And generally speaking, I have to say, uh, it works in that there is a range of people right across, and there are people on the left as well, um, who, are, who are banging away. I think a lot of Americans would say that it tends towards a public debate um, that is very, very full of sound and fury, and it doesn't always signify much. There is a real cacophony in the American kind of media marketplace, and the cool, calm, rational argument of, I don't know, you know, the, 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 well, the Today program or, or news now, Channel 4 News or wherever, where, where you kind of, you're not necessarily just intending to get two extreme people fighting each other. Um, you're looking for something a little more than that. That, that. There's a tendency to crowd that out. So it's not, within, it's not um, uh, something that is kind of problem-free. But generally, I think most Americans would just be absolutely shocked by the, the Michael Savage ban and, and say, well, well, well why? Do you think, I mean, Michael Savage has a, it's a huge show, it's syndicated and it's, it's a successful yeah. show. Do you think somebody like Michael Savage's success is due to the fact that people to the right, far to the right, feel that they are no longer being served by um, democratic ah. politics? <clears throat> well, that's a separate, I mean, that's an interesting issue and it's a kind of separate one that there is on the right and has been since Obama came to power a kind of desperation which occasionally veers into areas which are semi-legal and deeply worrying to many Americans. And there are two examples. Number one is those people who openly discuss um, a potential assassination of Obama. Now, you know, this is an area where the Secret Service will come down on you very hard, and they have come down on people very hard, um, if you go out and discuss it in sort of black and white terms. But that, if, if that sense is around because of the, um, uh, the Second Amendment, you still have this kind of, you still have this right to to um, to put it there in, in a way that you wouldn't have in another country. And the other thing that I mean, I don't know the extent to which people here already know about this, but this is this bizarre, um, uh, and there's any word for it, um, campaign um, on the right of the Republican Party suggests that Barack Obama is an illegitimate president that his birth certificate has been doctored and he never had the right to be president in the first place. And, you know, we all laugh, but my goodness, it, there are large numbers of Americans who believe that and who's kind of veered off the reservation, uh, in a way, into a place that is, that is worrying to Americans. To, 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 so both as a media thing, in terms of their freedom to say these things, 
Um, but also the, 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 the issue that they don't any longer kind of feel the sense that they are all in this together, that I was previously suggesting is very much a part of, of being an American. And I think it's a kind of watch this space thing. I think to, to many Americans it's, it's deeply worrying. Another question. The lady here with the blue uh, pull neck. Yeah, I, that really leads nicely into the thing that's been that I've been wondering about. I, I live over here, but you can tell from my accent where I grew up. Um, and and it says Americans love to be number one. If they're not number one, you know, they're not interested. There's been an awful lot of uh, talk now about the end of the American era, hegemony, whatever. And I've been wondering what happens when, what's, what do you think is going to happen when this gets even closer to the man in Kansas City? And uh, is this extreme right wing uh, experience that you've just uh, outlined to us, is this somehow connected uh, with a sense that the people on the right have that maybe America is no longer the kind of number one that they could just assume was their God-given right? I think they're really torn. Because I think on, on that fringe, it is terribly difficult in your mental setup to believe that America could ever be anything other than number one, even with Barack Obama as president. And I think that, you know, so they like to think that it's an aberration. And you've got a European socialist in charge. Um, and, and, and that'll go in, you know, you hope in four years, though frankly probably more likely in eight, um, particularly since the governor of, of South Carolina, who, you know, would have, I think have been one of the great possibilities of taking over for him, went off to Argentina with a woman who wasn't his wife. And, and, and subsequently... I thought, I thought he was just climbing hills. He was here, yes. Well, that's, yes, that was the unfortunate phrase they used. But yeah. anyway, so, so um, uh, you know, if you are a Republican, you're looking at the lightly runners and riders for 2012, you're quite likely to, to, to either to, to hold your, hand in, your head in your hands or to believe in people you know, kind of Sarah Palin and the various Sarah Palin look-alikes that are now around who who've ultimately, I don't think, have really got a hope of, of getting elected. So you feel pretty desperate. And then you're told America's best days are behind it. I don't think you believe that second thing. I think you might say it rhetorically, but I don't think most Americans are capable of regarding their nation as being, and I'm talking now about Kansas City, Missouri, as regarding their nation, I think they're capable of regarding their nation as misunderstood, I think they're capable of regarding their nation as economically troubled, and I think they can perfectly well understand that other people find ways of doing things that are better and cheaper, because that's part of American life, because if, you know, for, for generations, if things went bad in, in Kansas City, you'd have to up sticks and go to California or wherever. They understand that process, much better than Europeans do, actually. But, but the, the idea that, that America is on its uppers, I think, is a rhetorical thing. I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think they feel it realistically. And I think also, if, if, if they can sort out their education system, it's not on its uppers. Because, I mean, every 10 years, so, you remember when the Japanese bought the Rockefeller Center, and everyone was like, oh, that's the end of America, there you go. And, of course, it never happened. I mean, every 10 years, people say that someone else's GDP is going to rival the United States. But, you know, you go back to... If you, if, you, if you still have a system that is as open to talent as it has been historically, um, uh, other countries with their systems that are so sclerotic in so many ways are going to have an awful lot of trouble <clears throat> creating Google in their garages in the sense that America can create Google in garages. And that's what allows a society to, to carry on and revivify, and that's why I think America can. Do you think, there, there was a great phrase that, that Obama used, and I think it was during the campaign, where he said, in the unlikely story that is America. I mean, do you think that in a sense that is, that's the truth of America, its ability to regenerate and reinvigorate itself comes from its unpredictability. It yeah. doesn't really follow the rules that we're used to. <clears throat> to me, it is. If, if you, I mean, you can look at America and you can look at its, you can write a long list of its problems, um, but you do your own analysis of disservice if you don't write on the other side, it's faced a lot worse than this in the past and sorted it out. And there is this incredible ability that Americans have. Um, and, you know, they paid for it in, in, in blood and sadness, you know, you think of Steinbeck and, and think of the way in which the appalling suffering that there's been in the United States and various stages of its history where people have had to start again 
Um, and they still do start again. They still get in the old elderly old car and drive halfway across the nation to, to make a restart. And it's not always because they've just shot 15 people in a bank and they need to escape. <laughs> the world. You know, there is a kind of legitimate starting again that happens in, in the United States and doesn't tend to happen in, in other smaller countries and doesn't tend to happen in other countries with more structured society. Do you think that's also influenced by the degree of immigration that America was built on? I mean, I remember interviewing somebody whose who's, uh, father was a Holocaust survivor and it wasn't until he was in his 20s that he understood why his father always kept his car ser serviced and in the garage and kept a packed suitcase on, on top of the wardrobe. And it was because his father eventually explained to him, you never know when you might have to leave. You know, this sense in which the immigrants of America have also fostered that mentality of at any moment we are going to have to rely on yeah. ourselves all over again. Very ourselves much. So. It's, a, it's a country that encourages people who are forward-looking, who are thinking about their children's future maybe rather yeah. than theirs. You go to Las Vegas, and uh, as I did you know, a year or two ago to do a, a piece about poverty, and, and it's just heartbreaking. And there is, of course, you know, massive, terrible poverty around Las Vegas. Um, all the people working in the hotels, living in you know, really quite awful conditions, some of them in, in, in around the place. And many, many, many of them are recent immigrants. Uh, and they're willing to go through it. You talk again and again to families, you say, it's okay, we'll, we'll get through this, but I'm hoping now that you know, my child will get to go to the University of Nevada and won't have to do this and we'll do that. And there is this incredible kind of drive. And it is a self-selecting people. It selects people who are, who are going there in order to achieve something for future generations. Another question. Try and go further in. Yes, the, the woman with the turquoise scarf on, that's it. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned a few times the idea of kind of European socialism and how it's so abhorrent to some Americans and, you know, how the NHS is the worst thing ever to happen to the UK and, like, they'd never allow that in the US. And I was just wondering why you think that idea is just so terrible to some Americans? I think it's, it comes from this incredible kind of weird ruggedness of their entire upbringing and um, uh, uh, cultural baggage where, you know, when the settlers first moved out west, they got there before there was any kind of structure of government to, to defend them. So you, you saw them moving and then setting up for themselves, their own local law and order, their own local water system, whatever it needed to, 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 to stay alive. And the early settlers who starved in, in America tended to be aristocrats who couldn't sort of physically do anything and organize themselves. And the ones who survived were, were, were people who had a, had a physical skill that they could use. Um, and, and there is still this sense of self-reliance that I think makes Americans very, very um, uh, uh, ambivalent, at least, about allowing the government into any area of their lives, but particularly those sort of private areas of their lives, like your relationship with your doctor. Now, having said that, I think there is also a, a, an element of, of kind of bizarre sort of false consciousness of it. Where I, I, only two weeks ago, I was sitting in someone's sitting room in Southern... Maryland, and I was doing a, a, a radio documentary about the health system, and you are with two people, we were with two people, both of whom had cancer, and were very, very sick, and were taking kind of any number of, of drugs. And I said to them, um, you know, in the NHS, you'd get all this for free. I mean, they were, they were considering bankruptcy, these two. They were absolutely at the end of their tethers, <coughs> paying thousands of pounds. They were insured, but they were still paying thousands of pounds in co-pays. And um, they sort of thought about that for a bit and then they said well you know we still we still wouldn't want the government to be involved uh, and it's a sort of almost a mantra that you wonder whether it has any kind of meaning because the government actually is involved hugely in American health care particularly in Medicare the, 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 the health system for uh, elderly people mainly the, the, the government runs it so the idea of the government not being involved in US health care is actually rather ri ridiculous but it is yeah it's just a part of the setup and that's why the NHS has been so Traduced recently in in their um, in their debate, and why I think it is that Obama Obama would like a single payer system. I know that for, for a fact. He, his idea would be Canada or Britain, but he couldn't even begin to have campaigned for that. And one of the reasons he's in such difficulty now is that 
he didn't quite know where he should start the campaign, but he would have liked to have had a single-payer system. And many, many Americans who thought it through understand fully, for cost reasons, never mind fairness, that, that actually there are real advantages to the system that's on their doorstep in Canada, never mind looking across the Atlantic to us, but they won't go there. Where do you think it's going to go, healthcare? Can you... Can you well, I think that, yeah, question. I mean, they'll get, they'll get a watered-down version of, of, of what was anyway a pretty watery um, uh, effort. And they, they um, will deal to an extent with cost, um, but they won't manage, I don't think, to persuade most Americans that um, uh, a universal system is a good thing. And this is partly because the waters are muddier than you might think, because although I do genuinely think Americans don't kind of quite grasp the value of the kind of system that we have, the, the flip side of that is that we always come out with this 47 million uninsured. An awful lot of those people are uninsured because they choose to be uninsured. Because as a young, fit American, <laughs> You can just skip the whole thing. You don't have to pay any money at all. I mean, who goes to, you know, you, you're unlucky if you have to go to a doctor much when you're, when you're young. Um, and, and there is this ability just to avoid it and not, not pay at all, um, uh, either through taxes or through insurance. So, you know, part of that 47 million are not, frankly, people who are at the end of their tethers and who desperately need to be brought into the system. It's people who are avoiding being brought into the system. And that has been one of the real difficulties in those states where they've tried universal health care. Massachusetts being, being the, the, the best and most recent example. It's been quite tricky because people actually don't want it. They don't, they don't want to pay the money. Just time for two more questions. Uh, then let's go right up to the back. <laughs> the guy at the, on the, I think it's the second back row with the cream shirt on. Um, one of the interesting things from the campaign was uh, someone who was following Obama and saying that even after following him for weeks and weeks and weeks, he never saw him do anything that he didn't seem to be totally cool or completely unruffled and didn't understand how he did it. Um, and so you've been talking a lot about how Obama is different in terms of his views on health care. But then that American exceptionalism thing still suggests that you know, he still sees that. And in international negotiations like the Copenhagen climate change talks, you know, the American position has changed, but there's only so much that he can do. And so, so the first question is, how, how does he do it in terms of that campaigning and that whole coolness? And secondly, how exceptional does he still see America as being? And how much is the lack of change in American position due to him not wanting to do it or to still seeing America as being a different country? I, I think, I mean, the exceptionalism thing, as I was saying earlier, I, I just don't think we know, actually. And I don't think he's fully made up his mind how exceptional he thinks the United States is. I think he likes the idea of being liked. Um, internationally. He likes the idea of the United States being liked internationally. Whether he is willing to countenance being disliked if, if it means America going in what he regards as the right direction, which is what most Americans would like, I think, um, I think the, the jury is still out. Uh, when it comes to coolness, I mean, he makes... He, he is an extraordinary kind of self-controlled and um, uh, attractive individual as a person when you when you sit down with him. But he does make serious errors. And I wonder whether they, to an extent, he's, he's bought in, he's drunk the Kool-Aid to an extent that, that, that is worrying for his future. And I'll give you just two very brief examples. Number one, he made a joke on the Jay Leno show about the Special Olympics. And that's a bizarre joke. In fact, I think it was going back to his bowling. And he said, watching me bowl was like watching the Special Olympics. And people cringed. I mean, it was just such an odd thing. For someone who is so controlled, and so kind of conscious of, of saying and doing the right thing, and so genuinely, so it would seem, you know, someone who, who genuinely wants to do and say the right thing, which is a really weird, weird thing to say. And the other thing was he made a joke about Nancy Reagan. Uh, someone at, at his first press conference, so this is in Chicago, he's just been elected, he goes back to Chicago, someone says, someone stands up and says, Mr. President, are you going to take advice from former presidents? So this is the kind of, you know, what goes on the American media for a coruscatingly difficult question. <laughs> so this person had, had kind of written it down and got up like, Mr. <laughs> President, sure. And, 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 and she, the, the person had written down, are you going to take advice from other presidents? And then they corrected themselves and said, other living presidents. And, and <laughs> Obama, you know, Obama stood up and said, well, obviously living presidents. Uh, I'm not Nancy Reagan. 
And it, oh, there's this kind of horrified hush, because what he doesn't seem to have grasped... Was he was referring to the seance things? He was referring things. to the seance things. Yeah. There was a stage in which Nancy Reagan was a laughing stock, and many people disliked her. That, that, I mean, even I knew, I've only lived in America for eight years, I knew that had long gone. Nancy Reagan is now regarded as, you know, a, a, a grand and, and dignified old lady, you know, rather than the way the Queen Mother was in her heyday here. And the idea of just, just attacking her, just for fun, at a news conference, <laughs> was absolutely, it was so beyond the pale that it was shocking, actually, to, to, to see. Um, and even on the left, you know, Nancy Reagan was very much a campaigner for, for against uh, President Bush's ban on the use of federal funds for embryonic stem cell research. So, you know, for a whole host of reasons, Nancy Reagan ain't what she was. Uh, and, and for Obama not to realize that, I thought was an interesting insight into whether the cool actually kind of is, is, is skin deep to an extent, whether he, he really kind of gets it at a deeper level or whether he is so bright and so obviously um, keen on his own myth, and who wouldn't be when you have the achievements that he has behind him, that he'll come a cropper one day because of it. Okay, I'm going to wind things up there, I'm afraid, because I was given a little bit Sorry. of paper saying wind things up now. Um, I want to say thank you very much to Justin. I want to let you know that Justin will be available to sign his book. I've read it. It's very good. Um, can I ask you to enable Justin to get out without being trampled in the rush, just to stay in your seats until Justin gets out, and then everybody else oh, can go too. Thank you very much for your a time. Pilot on Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of the Media Society, and I'm Geraldine Sharp Newton with a very long American name, which was always shortened because in America you only could have a name that was ended in an I and had about four letters in it. Um, I want to thank Justin for really ensuring and over these many years that he gave us America warts and all. Yeah. And he really presented us with a picture of what was going on there. And sadly, I would have to say, having come from a news organization in America, that American news organizations have not really reported in the same way what is happening here and, in, in, and frankly, internationally. So a great thank you to Justin and to Kirsty for really a terrific interview. Thank you and hope to see you all again.